Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ron Halber, and I'm the executive director of the Jewish Community Relations Council of Greater Washington. And I'd like to thank the Jewish Federation of Greater Washington, who are partnering with us in today's briefing. The JCRC is leading our community's advocacy and uh, other engagement efforts in response to this horrific massacre in Israel. And one of our uh, one of our roles is to continue to keep our community educated and updated so that we can advocate and respond effectively. Following the brutal, humane, the inhumane attack by Hamas just four days ago, Israel is now at war, officially declared. An update on numbers, there was at least 900 Israelis killed, close to 3,000 injured, and 150 Israelis who have been taken hostage. This war is not one Israel wants, one that it must finish and do what is necessary to make sure nothing like this happens again. Many of you know our guest speaker, he's been with us many times, he's a treasurer in the Jewish community, an extraordinary experienced diplomat. Dennis Ross is here to brief us on the situation, a brief bio. Dennis is the counselor and William Davidson Distinguished Fellow at the Washington Institute for East Policy. He has served under President Bush, Clinton, and Obama, and has been playing key roles in shaping U.S. involvement in the Middle East for decades. He was instrumental in assisting Israelis and Palestinians to, re to reach the 1995 Interim Hebron Agreement, I'm sorry, the Interim Agreement, the, the 1997 Hebron Accord, and he facilitated the israel Jordan Peace Treaty and has intensely worked to bring Israel and Syria together. I'll just note that if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A. I can't promise we're going to get to all the que uh, to, to any questions today, or perhaps maybe only a few, because the ambassador's time is limited, and we want to take advantage to hear what he has to say. And But we'll see how that progresses. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Ron. Uh, I think the easiest way to start is just to explain that Israel is in a state of shock. And what I want to do is I want to explain what has happened, why it happened, uh, where things are likely to go. Uh, and based on whatever time we have left, we'll just get into your questions. So the first thing to understand, and maybe the question to ask is, so how could this have happened? How could Israel have been so taken by surprise? How could its military have been so ill-prepared uh, to deal with what actually happened. And I think we have to we have to take a step back. Whenever there's a strategic surprise, you you always had the facts you needed, but you didn't put the the details together because you had a set of assumptions. And those assumptions basically create a prism through which you see the world and you interpret all information. The Israelis operated on a premise. Uh, this is the intelligence community, the security establishment that Hamas did not want a war with Israel. Uh, over the last year or so, even two years, Israel has been prepared to allow up to 20,000 Gazans to work in Israel. Uh, this was seen by the Israeli military and security establishment, intelligence establishment, as creating an incentive for Hamas not to create great instability, not to produce conflicts, and not certainly to go to war. Uh, Partly I say that is because those 20,000 were earning 10 times what anybody in Gaza earned, assuming you could get a job in Gaza where you had 50% unemployment. Uh, and one of the issues for Hamas always seemed to be to push for, for more workers, not less. Each worker affected at least another seven people. So there was this assumption that allowing more and more to work was creating a, a, a constraint on Hamas behavior influence Hamas behavior, and there were episodes that tended to reinforce the Israeli attitudes. You may remember a couple of months ago, uh, after Israel and one of the raids in the West Bank killed a leading operative of Islamic Jihad, Islamic Jihad in Gaza fired rockets into Israel. Israel responded by killing the uh, several leading commanders of Islamic Jihad in Gaza, uh, it hit God, it hit all Islamic Jihad targets with missiles uh, and and not with, with uh, air to ground missiles. Uh, and Hamas didn't respond. And this tended to reinforce the Israeli attitude that Hamas wasn't looking for a conflict. In the last couple of weeks, things were heated up along the border where Hamas was again mobilizing people to go to the borders and with smoke bombs and uh, and the like. Uh, and that was interpreted as them wanting to put pressure on Israel to allow more to, to work, but also Qatar had cut its funding 
uh, to Hamas in Gaza. And this was a way to try to create pressure so Qatar would come in and, and reinforce the funding. That's how it was interpreted. Now, it turns out a lot of those who were going to the border were actually surveilling it for what was the what were the best places to try to break through the barrier there. So you have a mistaken assumption to begin with about where Hamas is coming from, uh, point one. And some of the deception, I think, in in the recent demonstrations and the negotiations to conclude those demonstrations, which were done through Egypt and Qatar with Israel, uh, it deepened this sense that Hamas is not looking for a conflict. So that's point one. Point two, why was the border so poorly defended? You now you have a huge barrier there, right? You, you know, anybody who's been down there sees what is the wall. Uh, that created a false sense of security. Israel also had spent uh, more than a billion dollars creating an underground barrier so they couldn't tunnel anymore. The combination of the two created a sense, okay, they tried to tunnel in the past, that's how they infiltrate, and we have the means against that. So they created a sense of complacency about the nature of the threat given what Hamas wanted and also the tools that Israel had there. But that's not the whole story. More of the story is that you had very limited military presence in the South because most of the military presence was in the West Bank because of the increase in violence over the last year. Uh, and, and definitely increased even more during the last uh, nine months of the with the new Israeli government. Uh, so most of the, the terror and the violence was in the West Bank. Some of it was in Israel, but most of it was in the West Bank. So you so the, the government understandably built required the IDF to greatly increase its presence uh, in the West Bank. Israel does not have a large standing army. It still is based on a reserve army. So when you add four battalions of active army to the West Bank, you're dramatically depleting forces that are available elsewhere. But there was also another front, and that was on the Lebanese border. Over the last two months, and I now feel this was part of a deliberate diversion, uh, Hezbollah engaged in a series of provocative actions along the border. So Israel beefed up uh, its presence in the north, anticipating that Hezbollah could do something similar to what Hamas actually did in the South. So you had this combination of circumstances that A, you're based on a, a false assumption, and B, you're dealing with what you perceive to be the more immediate threats. And so you have very few forces available in the South. All right, so that's that explains how you could have the uh, strategic surprise on the one hand, and you could have such a an unprepared military position in the South on the other. Now, when I say Israel is in a state of shock, you need to understand that as a complete understatement. Understand what happened in Israel on Saturday was the darkest day in Israel's history. Israel had never suffered that many fatalities and casualties in a single day, even during the worst day of the 1973 war. It lost almost as many on Saturday as it lost in four years of the Second Intifada. So the idea that this could happen, the shock, the scope, no one in Israel is untouched by what's happened. No one. Everybody knows someone or has a family member with what's happened. And it wasn't just the death and destruction. It was the taking of 150 hostages. Uh, it was the way people were killed. You know, not only wasn't Israeli intelligence bad, but unfortunately, the Hamas intelligence was good. They knew there was this rave party in the desert, which is where one of their uh, one group of the fighters and they infiltrated through once they they broke down using a uh, basically using a tractor to break down the barrier. Uh, they more than uh, like a thousand to twelve hundred of their fighters came in on pickup trucks with mounted machine guns uh, on motorcycles with submachine guns, uh, people coming in and hang gliders. This was well orchestrated, but they made a beeline for that party where they where they killed 300 people. They went into 22 separate communities. Uh, they broke into houses. Uh, the houses they couldn't break into, they set on fire. Uh, you know, they killed members of family in front of the other members of family, and then they took uh, the remainder as hostages. 
Uh, they took hostages as young as six months old. Now, I tell you all this, not just to, to make your blood boil. I want you to understand what Israelis are feeling. And I want you to understand something else. Ron, you said it at the outset, and I'm going to reinforce it. The outcome of this will not be a ceasefire. Let me repeat that. The outcome of this will not be a ceasefire. After, after the combat with Hamas in 2008-2009, uh, 2012, 2014, 2021, in between 2018 and 19, where it was only for a day or so, there was always a ceasefire. 2021 went on for 50 days. So they were ceasefires. Every ceasefire was used by Hamas to rebuild, retool, and put themselves in a position for another round. Israel will not let this end in a way where Hamas can have another round. It will decapitate Hamas. Uh, it will it will try to completely demilitarize, disarm it. Now, to do that, it's easy to say it. It's excruciating to do it. The price for Palestinians will be extremely high. The price for the Israeli military will be extremely high. I have spent a lot of time in Gaza. It's where I used to meet Yasser Arafat. Uh, Gaza is densely populated. The roads are narrow. In the cities, there are alleyways, there are tank traps. You can't send a tank into the most of these uh, alleyways. Um, they have thousands, they have hundreds of miles of tunnels. Every tunnel is booby-trapped. Uh, the cost to the IDF will be very high. The cost to Gazans will be far greater. There'll be very little infrastructure left. The images that will emerge on social media will produce a pressure on Israel to stop. You have to understand left to right in Israel today, left to right, everyone agrees Israel cannot be left in a circumstance where Hamas could do this again. So Hamas as an organization, the military objective will be to go in and to destroy it. Again, easy to say, very hard to do. Uh, the pressure on Israel to stop will, will be great. The potential for Hezbollah to open a second front will be significant, although I can get into that. I, I prefer, I'm going to hold that and maybe for a question to explain Hezbollah's calculus and Iran's calculus. But I, I want there to be an understanding that notwithstanding the pressure, unless it gets to a point where Israel finds it's too difficult to succeed at an acceptable price to Israel, the outcome of this is going to be a, a Hamas that is no longer able to govern uh, in Gaza. Which will require... Ask, is there a way that Israel can go into Gaza creatively that we can think that there's any way except to avoid urban fighting and to take no. over? No. Okay. First of all, where do you think the Hamas leaders are? In tunnels and they're, in the den they're under they're uh, they're under hospitals they're under moss they're in tunnels all in the most densely populated areas by design of course. so the cost will be terrible but you have a country that says we don't have a choice because hamas is isis hamas is al-qaeda because it is it exposed itself for what it is you don't do the things. Who kidnaps a six-month-old baby? Who does that? I mean, who kidnaps and takes us hostages? Grandmothers in their mid-80s in wheelchairs. Who does that? There are no norms of civilization that Hamas respects. And the response to them has to reflect that. And I'm saying this quite consciously because we collectively have to begin to describe Hamas that way. It's the only way to explain what we're going to contend with. The sympathy for Israel is great right now. When the images on social media begin to emerge of what's happening in Gaza, you're going to see attitudes begin to shift. Pressures on the administration will begin to shift. Uh, it is significant that we sent a carrier battle group to the coast. It sends an interesting message, not just of support. Those who think it, it, you know, we're just there as a pure symbol. Yes, it's mostly true. 
but these are this there are two destroyers that are that have aegis uh, anti-missile missiles there is enormous early warning intelligence capability which will all be shared with the israelis so you know the administration is doing all the right things it organized a statement yesterday that's never been said before uh, by the british the french the germans and the italians with us uh, emphasizing Israel's right of self-defense, condemning absolutely what Hamas has done. But we need and to anticipate uh, what's going to come, and we need to frame publicly what is required. And I put it, I'm putting this not solely in terms of what's in Israel's interest. It's in America's interest. And, I, and the reason for that is that if Hamas is seen as succeeding, it means all the radical forces in the Middle East that Iran is, that Hezbollah is, all the radical forces in the Middle East will gain enormous leverage. All the, the more pragmatic, more moderate Arab uh, leaderships will be put on the defensive. All of them will be on the defensive before their own public to say, look, their ways works. This is when President Biden likes to talk about a fulcrum or, or an inflection point between democracies and authoritarianism. It's it's more complicated than that. It's it's you know there are are those who may not be democracies, but who should be part of our coalition. Some of them are in the Middle East, and they will be put on the defensive. They will shift postures if it looks like the the leverage and the pressure uh, and the positions of the radical coalition there. The you know what what Iran likes to call the axis of resistance, the axis of mokawama, which is what uh, the word for resistance is in Arabic. Uh, they're not. The, I call them the axis of failed and failing states. They need to be seen as failing now. Hamas needs to say, look what they did. Not only did they produce incredible costs for Palestinians, but they were destroyed in the process. Now it'll be hard, as I said. I don't want to exaggerate you know, that this is something that can that is easy to do. It is not. It is profoundly hard. But we need to be framing this issue for what it is. This is a struggle in a, in a very clear way between good and evil. There's no other way to put it. What Hamas did crossed every line of every norm of civilization. Uh, and we need collectively to reflect that. Hamas is not the Palestinians, all right? They're not one and the same, although Hamas wants to be representative of them. Palestinians are a people, and they're going to suffer. I have someone I talked to yesterday in Gaza, that I, and in Gaza that I know, and she's already lost 15 members of her family to what's happening. I, you know, This doesn't... I feel great sadness for what's going to happen to Palestinians there, but collectively... We know who's responsible. Hamas is responsible. They're bringing this on the Palestinians. I have an article that will come out tomorrow where I lay out, you know, every time they've had a chance to choose something that would be good for their people, they choose the opposite. So when we think about this, we have to understand where this is headed. The likelihood is somehow Hamas in one way or another will be likely removed from power. There will need to be an interim administration. Israel should call on the international community, the UN, to create an international presence to go in and create a trusteeship in Gaza. They should organize an interim administration. They should prepare for elections six to nine months later. There needs to be an alternative. There needs to be a reconstruction plan for Gaza with a different leadership. All that needs to be part of a larger strategy. And issues that will come up about what's going to happen in Israel when this is over, the day after. There will be a day after for everybody, in Israel too. The Argonaut Commission in 1973 after the, the 19, after the Yom Kippur War, it, it found, it investigated the, the failures. Same thing will happen here. There will be an investigation of the failures. There's time to do that later. What has to happen now is ensure that Hamas can never again be a threat to Israel. Okay, let me stop there since I think I kind of frame the issues. Thank you, Ambassador. I'm going to just, what I'm doing is I have like 30 questions in front of me and I'm kind of compiling them and boiling them down. How does the hostages affect Israel's ability? How, is, how will the hostages factor into Israel's uh, ability to destroy 
uh, Hamas, knowing that their hostages will probably be killed in, in the process. You know, uh, one of the terrible dilemmas of leadership is when you have to make these kinds of excruciating choices. Hamas took the hostages because they know how Israel has traditionally related to hostages. You trade over a thousand prisoners, including some with the worst, you know, who committed the worst uh, killings against Israelis, for one Israeli soldier, Gilad Shalit. Hamas knows the history. So they thought if they took all these hostages, uh, again, it gave them leverage towards the Israelis and it would create a deterrent. It's not that Israel won't try to, to rescue hostages, but they're not going to let that determine in the end, as terrible as it is to say, as terrible as it is to say, if you have family members there, um, that's not going to shape what the Israelis are going to do. I can tell you, I was on the phone with a senior uh, Israeli yesterday who had a creative idea about what might be done in terms of, I don't get into it, but just sort of sequencing, you know, how you might approach things. And he said, no one is prepared to listen. Uh, because again, they, it cannot look like business as usual. And the truth is the whole paradigm has shifted. Right. And when I say it in Israel, the paradigm shifted, I'm not saying the paradigm has shifted everywhere else. There will be a strong impulse to get Israel to stop. We all know that's coming, but that's why you have to frame this issue. This was Israel's 9-11. Don't expect them to respond in a way that is less severe than the way we responded. And by the way, our 9-11, even though we didn't know it, was over in a day, right? It didn't continue. They're still fighting battles. They're still popular. Right. They're... So, you know, we have to understand where the Israelis are. Um, and this is a left to right issue. Uh, if if, uh, if you haven't read it, you should read the interview in The Atlantic with Amir Tibon, uh, who is who writes for Haaretz. I know him. He's very smart guy, definitely on the left side of the political spectrum. Uh, you know, he lived down there. He made a decision to live down there after 2014 with his family. Uh, and, you know, he basically says the state failed to protect them. And his own story. They can't, they can't live with. Oh, it happens. no longer live with this. I know his own story about how he was rescued. I'm here as a personal friend from Washington when he was right. the state of an over CNN about how his father came down. Uh, next question, Hezbollah and Iran reaction. Um, <clears throat> Hezbollah has been, the last several years, there was a kind of mutual deterrence between Israel and uh, and Lebanon and, and Hezbollah. Uh, and it's because Hezbollah has 150,000 rockets. Now, not all of them can cover all of Israel. Not all of them can carry big payloads of bombs, uh, but probably 75,000 can. About a thousand of those have precision guidance on them. The Iron Dome works by being able to discriminate among the rockets that are coming in. If you're going to hit an open area, it ignores it. Everything is guided by radar. Uh, the radar is a command control and triggers a launch. Uh, so anything that's going to hit a target, it goes after. And it's been 90% successful. The problem is it can be saturated. That's what happened, by the way, on Saturday. Hamas did a barrage of 3,000 rockets to cover what they were doing. Uh, Hezbollah can launch 3,000 rockets a day for a month. So they know Hezbollah, Nasrallah, Hassan Nasrallah knows if he does that, Lebanon gets destroyed and much of Hezbollah may be destroyed, notwithstanding everything Israel has to do in Gaza. Now his, he is trying to deter the Israelis from going in by incrementally ratcheting things up on the border. Yesterday, there was an attempt at infiltration, not by Hamas, I mean, not by Hezbollah, by, but Hamas that is allowed to operate in southern Lebanon by Hezbollah. And Hezbollah said, we didn't do it. Then there was firing of mortars in. Israel retaliated. Israel hit the site from where the mortars came from, and they killed three Hezbollah operatives. Uh, today, there was rocket fire, again, just across the border into Israel. Now, when he responds that way, Nasrallah, he's signaling, I'm, we're going to do something, we're not going to do nothing, but we want to keep it limited. If you suddenly see rocket fire that hits Tel Aviv, then this is, all bets are off. The issue here, I think, is he's been trying, he conveyed through the Egyptians that if Israel goes into Gaza on the ground, then they will come in. 
I think that's a bluff. I don't mean to say I don't think there's a high risk that this there may be an all-out war, but I think that's a bluff. And I'll explain. Iran has always looked at Hezbollah as kind of its reserve to use against Israel if Iran is attacked. And Iran right now thinks it might be attacked. So it denied it had anything to do with the Hamas attack, though it it trumpeted it, celebrated it, had demonstrations in favor of it, but denied it had anything to do with it. So that tells you there is it it doesn't want to be attacked, but it's it will hold Hezbollah in reserve. So it isn't. If it becomes clear they don't think they'll be attacked, they're much less likely to hold in reserve, although I think they're probably pressing Hezbollah to do more even now, at a, at a minimum, to distract the Israelis. I think Nasrallah had a calculus, based on all the divisions in Israel over the judicial overhaul, uh, he was talking about how weak Israel had become. And I think part of the calculus for all of this was the perception of the divisions. I think he now knows the coalescence in Israel is actually unbelievable. I should say something about that. I Ooh. talked only about the state of shock. <clears throat> the number of reservists who've shown up, first brothers in arms immediately said everybody report for duty. The number of reservists who've showed up greater than at any point in the history of a, of a war with it, that Israel's facing. The percent. Wow. It is the unprecedented. How many they, have called up, Ambassador? 300? Sorry? How many have been called up? I heard 300,000 at this point. There's more than 300,000. Okay. More than 100,000 are opposite the Gaza, are down on the Gaza border. Uh, more than 300,000 overall. Uh, so there's that response. There are uh, Israelis are opening their homes to people from the north and the south. Israelis are giving blood in unprecedented numbers. Israelis are organizing food banks, uh, again, to be sure that people, you know, have food. This is a colossal community-wide, countrywide effort. It involves everybody. The divisions that everyone saw, they're gone. I'm not saying there won't be recriminations after the, after the war. There will be, because what happened is unacceptable. But now... The task at hand uh, is to demonstrate unity. I do believe there'll be a national unity government. I'm a little surprised it hasn't happened already, but I do believe there'll be a national unity government, partly because it sends a signal to Hezbollah and to Iran uh, that it will make them somewhat more cautious, I believe. Now, that isn't to say that there can't be the wrong target doesn't get hit. There isn't a miscalculation. This, you send signals when you use force that aren't always understood. So the chances of a real escalation and a, and a, a major the northern front opening up with a terrible war there because Hezbollah is dramatically more powerful than Hamas. Um, you know, that the potential is there. The potential for things heating up in the West Bank is there. Even among, you know, 5% of Israel's, uh, Israel's Arab population are radical. Now, 5% doesn't sound like much, but out of a million population, that's 50,000. So don't be so sure. We can't be so sure what's going to happen. The longer this drags on, the worse things get in Gaza and the like. But has, has this just a question, uh, one question. Has what happened in Israel eroded your confidence and the public and the Israelis' confidence in their military and their ability to defend themselves, especially if they have to fight a war in Gaza, in the north, and against Iran simultaneously? Well, anybody who says that Israel hasn't been shaken by what's happened is kidding themselves. Um, I mean, been in their military confidence today. No, I know, I, I, but I'm getting at that. Is, is the level of confidence is the same it was uh, last Friday? No, but on the other hand, understand that there's an understanding that there is no choice. There is no alternative. Uh, and there is a sense that once the Israeli military is fully mobilized, it will be effective. Um, I saw one article that talked about, look, maybe this shows the Israeli military isn't as good as, as people thought. I don't think that's true. They're talking about they don't have the same level of difference. I don't think that's true at all. I think what happened was if you have nobody down there and the command control immediately gets disrupted through a combination of cyber 
and a base being taken over very quickly, uh, you know, that the under the lack of preparation for the South, you can't make up with that. You had, you, you know, I will tell you, you had small pockets of Israeli soldiers showing up being dramatically outnumbered and running out of ammunition. OK, because there was no preparation for this. That part is reminiscent of 73. Uh, you had major generals engaged in, in the fighting themselves. The story of uh, Amir Timon's father drives down. You know, he's 62, retired general. He drives down. He saves several uh, who are wounded and then goes and, you know, picks up one other retired general. They take the arms they took from the from the wounded soldiers and they go in there with other soldiers, you know, with a, with with active duty soldiers. You know, this was a case of extraordinary heroism at the same time. And don't don't assume you're not going to see that there is a you know, now there's a sense of survival. That is being at stake again. Again, think about it. this is. This is like 48 because of the number of casualties within Israel. When we are out there, um, when when the crest of this starts changing, when right now it's very easy to be sympathetic to Israel in the world and I mean, the White House is lighting up and the Western democracies are showing support. In the next two weeks or so, we're going to start hearing the tip when Israel, but now, however and whenever Israel decides to retaliate, we all know it's going to be massive. It's a matter of timing. Um, there's going to be called, there's going to be, we're going to hear articles about disproportionate force, the cycle of violence, blah, 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 blah. You're going to hear something else. You're going to hear about disproportionality. Yeah, right. Now that's the third okay. one. And there is no such thing as disproportionality when you're dealing with those who respect no proportions whatsoever. What is, and on that thing, what is the most effective thing that American Jewish supporters and American non-Jewish supporters can do over the next few weeks to maintain that level of critical political support for Israel and to deal with the media bias that takes place? Frame the issues. Israel is dealing with ISIS. Israel is dealing with Al-Qaeda. There is no alternative. Frame the issues. Repeat that over and over again. Have a simple theme. Make it a mantra. Uh, it, should, it should be said everywhere. So this is what seeps into the consciousness. And again, one other point. Draw a distinction between Hamas and the Palestinians. It cannot look like there's indifference to the suffering of Palestinians. Because that, first, it's wrong. And secondly, it discredits you. So draw, A, Hamas is, uh, is ISIS, and Hamas is not the Palestinians. They are not the Palestinians. People are talking about the difference between the uh, how the Palestinian Authority will be reacting here. Does it really show the difference between the Palestinian Authority with whom you possibly could reach an agreement with on the West Bank versus Hamas. I mean, so how, what is the Palestinian Authority's reaction to this? And do we believe they're just suppressing a, a Hamas majority that would take over if they were no longer in place? Look, I think one of the things you have to understand is that the there is the Palestinian Authority will talk about stop the killing of Palestinians, that, you know, this is what happens when occupation goes on forever. Uh, what do you expect? Uh, we have to stop the escalation. We have to save Palestinians. Uh, that's what they'll say in public and in private. They'll want Hamas to be destroyed. Every Arab leadership will echo what I just said. Let's bring the killing to an end. Uh, you know, we have to save Palestinians. Uh, and in private, the last thing they'll want will be a, a Hamas to emerge from this looking like they won because they know what it means for them. That duality in the Middle East has not disappeared. Does uh, Israel rely too much, Ambassador, on technology and not and and need to start putting more time into manpower? Uh, you know, again, there's these kind of quick pack answers that I, I know. I just thought it was an interesting. It's not a you know, Israeli man. The Israeli military forces are quite effective. Think about how they, they go into the West Bank all the time. They engage in these big firefights, and they almost they almost never get killed. Right. How is that? Because sure. their tactics are very good. They know how to do this. So it's not a... The problem was not uh, the failure of the military knowing how to operate. The problem was there was no military down there. 
This was bare bones. They were surprised. Uh, so, you know, but also make no mistake, there will be a very serious lessons learned after this. There won't just be an investigation, you know, to say, how could this happen? The military itself will conduct a serious lessons learned. Uh, and looking at the whole spectrum of what of the threats that they faced and and uh, the assumptions that were made and how you have to adjust to that. One of the questions we've been getting and we receiving is that given the enormity of the number of Hamas terrorists that took place and actually that they sent in reinforcements afterwards, why did it take Israel so long to respond? And that's the first thing. And secondly, even why wasn't there a minimal presence on the border? It seems for most people that there was practically nobody there. And people are astounded, astounded that they could, uh, that there was no retaliation, that there was, I mean, there wasn't, you know, 100 soldiers on the border who can resist or 200 soldiers that could fire back uh, and, and dissuade this. That's what people, I'm, I'm hearing a lot as I've been doing speaking, Ambassador, I've been, and, and the people come, there's just a sense of incredibility that people can't believe that there wasn't a couple hundred soldiers there based, even in an army that is small, to deal with a potential threat. First, as I said, Israel is a reserve army. Second, the bulk of the of the military was deployed elsewhere. Third, the assumption was there isn't going to be an attack, and if there is, we'll get we'll have advance warning. So, if we need to to build up the presence there, we'll be we'll have the time to do it. Uh, and fourth, was the barrier wouldn't be so easy to breach, uh, and that they thought again because of the the underground uh, barrier that had been built, they thought they wouldn't do it overland. They would try to do it through tunnels, and that was blocked. They went right through the wall as if it wasn't even had a, Yes, they just they drove a, literally a tractor up to the wall, and they wrote the wall down. Um, and the presence was too, too limited. Um, you know, why did it take them so long to respond? Because there's they, a, a tank base, again, with limited personnel was overrun. Uh, and the consequence of that was the whole command, that could, they broke down the communications structure. I mean, I myself have a hard time understanding why weren't helicopter gunships immediately sent down there. But I think there was a level of confusion. Uh, again, when things are unprepared, shock takes over, you know, confusion is high, communication is bad. And I mean, here's one other factor. It's on a, it's on a Shabbat. And Simchat Torah, and and increasing numbers of the officer corps are religious. So, and because it's a because it's a religious holiday, most you know were most were unaware, and they didn't have their phones on. So you know it's a it has implications for what you do on religious holidays and and on Shabbat. It was a it, this was like a perfect storm. Everything that could have gone wrong did go wrong. And then it took a while to reestablish order because these guys, you know, they went into all these different communities. They they took hostages and, you know, within these communities, every house had to be cleared out. And many of them came dressed in Israeli military uniforms. So, you know, this was, they planned this very well. Their intelligence was very good. And Israel's was unfortunately very bad. From what you know from speaking with your with your relationships with, Israel, with Israeli officials, how mu how many terrorists remain in Israel, and has Israel re has re has Israel secured the border? The A they've secured the border. B uh, I don't believe they're not entirely sure that there aren't there might not still be a few pockets elsewhere. They have killed the Israelis have killed something like fourteen or fifteen hundred at this point. I mean, I'm talking about those who tried to infiltrate. Later on, there was those who were inside Israel, and then there was an effort later to send more into Israel. So the majority of people, who, the majority of Hamas terrorists who came in were killed. Uh, all, I've, my understanding is almost all of them have been have been killed. Uh, there may have been some that were captured, but almost all have been killed. Israel did send, as I said, I think earlier, uh, they did send a commando team into Gaza, and they captured a deputy commander of Hamas not for trading purposes, but for intelligence purposes. Um, 
one question is, do you think that this will, that do you, let me try to reframe this, will the Saudi US Israeli talks be able to get back on target? And how does this whole episode influence them? They're completely on hold. No one in Israel is thinking about that right now. And the, no Saudis, the Saudis are rooting for the Israelis privately. They, they, they sure as hell don't want Hamas to win. But they're, what they're saying publicly, again, is what I was describing before. Um, but they understand the consequences of Hamas winning. Um, now, the, this, the idea of a breakthrough, it, it doesn't disappear, but it's for sure on hold. Uh, and it uh, much depends upon how this ends, how long it takes for it to end. Uh, at some point, I think it can be renewed, again, because ultimately the Saudis weren't doing this because this was a favor to anybody. MBS saw this as being profoundly in Saudi interest, given what he was getting from the United States, and because he also sees what he gains with Israel, but it's primarily what he was getting from the United States. That was the impetus. So his interest in that isn't going to change. Uh, but you, this is not something you can talk to. That it, there isn't any Israeli who is focused on this at all right now. The attention is on what is the task at hand. Do you foresee the United States aiding Israel militarily either with a retribution, either in response to Gaza or Hezbollah, or is that be solely reserved to Iran? You know, one thing that Israel has never asked, Israel has never wanted a single American soldier to have to fight for Israel. And that's not going to be changed. Now, what they want from us right now, which is not so simple because we have you know, our own stores are somewhat depleted, except not in this area. They want precision guided missiles, which we don't provide to to Ukraine. Uh, they want more interceptors for Iron Dome. Uh, and really what they want is they want money for production lines to produce more Iron Dome interceptors. There is a need for some ammunition. Now there, there is a problem because um, that has been you know, we're trying to keep up with what is required for Ukraine. There is a, you know, there's a readiness now for uh, the, the Democrats and Republicans on a bipartisan basis want to do a supplemental to support Israel. The overwhelming support for that on the Hill. The problem is the Republicans are, are saying that the Democrats want to marry it to a supplemental for Israel and Ukraine, and the Republicans only want to do it for Israel. Uh, given Biden's natural instincts, I mean, I, I think he obviously wants to do both, but in the end, he will go along. If the Republicans won't go along with it for Ukraine, uh, he will probably go along with it for Israel. Uh, as I said, look, the fact that we dispatch, the, people need to understand, you dispatch a carrier battle group. This is a huge force, a carrier that that that, um, that has 72 aircraft, um, Aegis cruisers, destroyers that have very significant anti-missile missile capability. Um, this is a significant presence right there. So we can help in terms of the the threat environment picture, uh, possible launches, um, intelligence as it relates that we share with the Israelis uh, for operational purposes. But I don't see us being involved directly, using our forces directly. Would that change if Iran got involved, do you think? Uh, it might depend. First of all, if you hit any of our forces, then we're in. Um, I personally would like to see us. We actually have uh, a Marine amphibious unit that's deployed in the Gulf area. I'd like us to keep it there because I want Iran to see that. Any reason why I think an emergency government hasn't been found hasn't uh, come to fruition yet? Say it again. Any reason why? Any reason, any reason why it's taken so long for an emergency government to be formed? Well, I have a suspicion that there's, you know, that uh, there's probably some political calculations. Um, I mean, look, I think it should have been formed already. Uh, I, I would have expected Netanyahu to announce it yesterday. I think he should have announced it yesterday. Uh, Gantz and Lieberman had said no conditions they would come in. Uh, I don't know if Lapid was saying that, you know, Smotrich and Ben Yavir had to leave. 
Um, I would be surprised, but it may be, could be over what are the responsibilities, who's sitting in the security cabinet. Uh, I believe it'll happen. And I believe it'll happen because uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu has his own reason to want a maximum umbrella of support given how difficult this is going to be. Uh, and because it also sends a signal to Hezbollah, you may have counted on our divisions and weakness. Those are gone. Final question, Ambassador, and then we're going to continue the program after you have to take off for about five minutes with others. Iran's engagement in this, how culpable is Iran in this? You hear the president saying there's no evidence. The Israelis are saying they're involved. I don't think there's anybody on this call who's pro-Israel doesn't believe Iran is involved in some way or providing training. What do you think? Well, I mean, it, it depends what you mean by involved. If you say are they if you say are they involved, do they provide um, money, training, encouragement, weapons? Uh, yes, to all that. Did they did they bring did Hamas leaders go to Tehran? Yes. Did Iran organize meetings uh, in Lebanon with Hamas and Hezbollah uh, and Revolutionary Guard people? Yes. Did they organize and plan and direct this? No. And I'll explain why. If they had gotten that involved with the details, the operational security would have probably been compromised. Too many people would have known. Israel would have picked up the signals, and they, and they didn't. I think they were very careful how they, they did this. Did they, going back a year, encourage them to do something like this? Yes. Did they help at that time probably work with them on how to plan an operation like this? Probably yes. Did they know exactly about this and direct it? Probably not. Ambassador, thank you so much for being available to us and for your expertise, strategy, thoughtfulness, and advising the Jewish community. Somebody would rather have, we'll probably call on you again as this conflict continues to please keep our community engaged. And as we do our, our we are going to be, most of our efforts right now are going to be sustained in maintaining that political support and media support and uh, the support of the American people as the difficult weeks come ahead. And we will take your advice and frame the argument. Uh, there is nothing more important than that in the days that are going to come up. All right. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Ambassador. You're welcome. Those of you who, who are still on the line, I've been joined by 945 people. I want to tell you about a couple of community events that are taking place. Today in D.C. at 7 o'clock at Addis Israel, there will be a gathering for the D.C. Jewish community and others. On Thursday in Maryland, there will be at 7.30 at Har Shalom. And in Virginia, uh, at 7.30 at the Poses JCC. I don't have the correct date in front of me, Adam, for the Poses JCC. Thursday. Thursday. And I'm also getting ready, and I think everybody who's pro Israel on this line should remain. The JCRC will be announcing in the coming hours we will be holding a mass rally in support of Israel on this Friday, 12.15 at Freedom Plaza. We're, we're asking all friends of Israel, Jewish and not, to please join us as we gather with political leaders, interfaith leaders, um, Israelis, and others to show our support for Israel during this time. Now, many of you may not know, but as part of the person who helps us so much, and this is Adam Odesser, who is our director of our Israel department, who is Israeli, and who was an officer in the IDF, and, is, and, and, and has been in touch with his own family and friends in Israel, and we thought we, we'd just give Adam a moment or two to talk about this from a personal basis. Because in the end, as the ambassador said, this is Israel's worst day in its history. Yeah, thank you, Ron. And, and I thank all of you for being here. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's been a few days. Um, and I might repeat a little bit about what the ambassador said and talked about. But as the ambassador mentioned earlier in this webinar, you know, not only Israel, but for the entire Jewish people, we have not witnessed the murder of so many people just because they're Jewish since the Holocaust. And Hamas, a terrorist organization, and we should need to continue saying this deliberately, went after Israelis to kill women, children, elderly, entire families. All of these, survivors. These, these acts, these acts committed by these people are unspeakable, pure evil. And again, we haven't seen something like this since the Nazis in World War II. And we know right now Hamas are hidden underground in bunkers, protecting themselves by continuing to use their own people 
as human shields, and now Israeli citizens as well. Let us not be mistaken, and, and the ambassador said this very clearly. They don't care about human life. They don't care about their own people. And at some point in the coming days or weeks, when Israel defends itself and retaliates, Media, pundits, and others will begin to ask or say that Israel is using excessive force. But the truth is that Hamas is responsible for this. Israel does not need to apologize for using its full capabilities. When you fly rockets from people's homes and living rooms and hospitals and schools and mosques, you are responsible for putting those people in danger, not Israel. So this is a time to respond. Israel needs to take any measure and action necessary to never, and I repeat, never see this happen again.